we will start let's hold up good evening friends after a lot of persuasion we were ultimately able to succeed to ask justice av chandrasekhar to share his insights we have already seen that the sessions taken by him are doing exceedingly well and before going live to the session we were talking that program and associates has actually in fact helped us to bridge with resource persons like justice chandrasekhar to speak on various perspectives of law and whatever little i could gather in when they were talking and that that they keep on taking topics which are quite fascinating not only for the students those who are preparing for the judiciary and different entrances and today topic when we were discussing with justice devi chand shekhar before we finalize the topic he said that his past experience has shown that dimensions in private defense and ipc is one topic which is slightly niche also coupled with the fact one can able to understand then he is able to master the judicial process also in that manner before we'll ask just devi chandra shekhar a former judge from karnataka high court to share his knowledge i will ask our knowledge partner trivikram to share his insights because he knows him we have been connected with just chandra shekhar virtually he has been connected with him virtually as well as physically over to you trivikram thank, thank you vikas chandra sir i am so grateful to honorable mr justice avi chandra shekhar sir for accepting our invite uh, it was quite some time since we had sir on our panel nevertheless i was just remembering the days where i used to go and sit in his court hall and that court uh, that proceeding itself used to be like a classroom for me i used to observe uh, nevertheless whether he was dealing with a bail matter or a revision petition or rsa or any any uh, matter as such so his in depth knowledge is something very appreciated and uh, of course all of our viewers are very well aware that sir is a erudite speaker so once again sir on behalf of uh, beyond law clc and my personal behalf sir i extend a very warm welcome to you uh good evening and also good welcome take this opportunity to welcome all my other uh, brother and sister advocates also see a uh, senior uh, mediator mr prashant chandra who is logged in and my other uh, colleagues uh, including mr renuka radhya who is a cgp the kumar mn who is a cgc a lot of uh, faculty members a lot of academicians law students uh, i welcome one and all over to you will lordships good evening mr vikas good evening mr trivikram and good evening uh, esteemed viewers uh, i deem it a great privilege Uh, to join this platform mr vikas has been doing uh, yeoman service through this platform to educate uh, lawyers the general public uh, law students and all those who are interested in knowing different dimensions of law friends uh, i was a, a sessions judge for almost 17 and half years before being elevated as a judge of the high court of karnataka uh, i was uh, Uh, conducting criminal cases also as a lawyer while I was working in in the municipal court. Uh, with my experience as a judge, uh, I feel that uh, most of the lawyers conducting criminal cases uh, are not much focusing on these on this aspect, general aspect exceptions. Mr. Vikas. has just observed that it is a fascinating aspect in criminal law not only a fascinating aspect it is but also a relevant aspect in criminal justice system uh, all those who are uh, conducting criminal cases must endeavor to know deeply about the general exceptions found in chapter 4 of indian penal code section 76 to 106 of ipc make an offense a no a non offense this is the beauty of section 76 to 106 in all offenses are defined and in cpc and the general exceptions found in chapter 4 wide section 76 to 106 make an offense non offense the general exceptions enacted by 
IPC are universal application are of universal application and for the sake of brevity of expression instead of repeating in every section that the definition definition is to be taken subject to the exceptions the legislature in its wisdom by section 6 of IPC has enacted that all the definitions in IPC must be regarded as a subject to the general exceptions. Hence, general exceptions are part of definition of a very offence contained in IPC, but with a caveat, the burden is upon the person who takes up the plea of private, any defence under the general exceptions. Therefore, it is relevant to have a view about section 6. What, is, what does section 6 say? Definitions in the code to be understood subject to exceptions. Throughout this code, this code means Indian Penal Code, every definition of an offence, every penal provision and every illustration of every such definition or penal provision shall be understood subject to the exceptions contained in the chapter entitled General Exceptions Though these exceptions are repeated in such definition, penal provision or illustration. So, section 6 itself provides that all the offences defined under CPC are subject to ex the general exceptions. Friends, uh, now what are those 76 to 106? Section 76 to 106 of IPC speak about general exceptions. So they can be easily categorized into seven groups. Group 1, mistake of fact. It is covered under section 76 to 79. Uh, 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 76, and seven, uh, 76 and 79. Judicial acts, sections 77 and 78. Accident. Section 80, absence of criminal intent, sections 81 to 86, 92 to 94, consent, sections 87 to 91, trifling acts, section 95, and private defense, it is covered under sections 96 to 106. <clears throat> now, absence, I'll just uh, at the cost of repetition, probably I might have uh, uh, already brought to your notice one incident in a case which was brought before me when I, while I was uh, the session stated would be with regard to the absence of criminal intent. A, a young, well built man of 35 to 30, 35 years was brought before me. He was in judicial custody. Uh, the charge against him was that he had, uh, without there being any sudden and grave provision, provocation, hit his father on his head with an wooden slap, a uh, wooden piece. As a result of the same, he fell down and breathed his last. This was witnessed by his own mother. That means the wife of the deceased. When she raised alarm, the neighbors came running there. So this was the offense. He was charged and brought before me. I explained to him the grave offense of uh, offense stated to have been committed by him. He had pleaded, uh, uh, he had not pleaded guilty and had claimed to be tried. As a result of the same, I had to summon the witnesses. The first witness was none other than his own mother, who was the eyewitness. So she came before the court. She promptly deposed in her examination in chief as to what has happened. She had deposed that there was no sudden and grave provocation. There was some uh, uh, exchange of words between the father and the son. Suddenly he took a, a wooden piece and 
hit on his head as a result of which he fell down. But during the course of the examination in chief, she had volunteered that uh, soon after he fell down, her husband fell down, the son went into the kitchen and brought a pot bo with boiling rice and poured on, his, uh, on the stomach of the deceased and went and slept in the room. Of course, this was not to be found anywhere in the charge sheet. The learned counsel appearing for the accused was a young boy. Probably it was his first uh, criminal case, the two uh, case of uh, murder. He was finding very difficult during the course of cross-examination to elicit uh, anything in favor of uh, his client. It was very difficult. And uh, I thought, you know, uh, the accused, the accused and the witness were all uh, rustic villagers. The normal presumption is that a rustic villager will always speak the truth, will not uh, 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 attempt to uh, sue it in a manner uh, so that uh, it could be otherwise. And he was not getting anything. Then at that time, exactly. When this was going on, the accused who was in the accused dock, he was turning his head right, left, up and down. He was behaving in an unusual manner for almost 10 minutes and I was closely observing uh, from, the, from my seat. And suddenly I stopped the recording of evidence and asked uh, the advocate, learned advocate, as to whether he had seen the unusual behavior of his uh, um, client. He said, no, sir. At least I put a simple question to him as to whether he had made any evaluation of his client. He said, no, sir, nobody had come. I told him that it is true that nobody had come because it was a case of family incident. At least you should have examined him as to, about his mental faculty. He said, no. Then uh, I asked the mother who was in the witness box, uh, why your son is behaving like this in the court hall, even in a small criminal case of section 323 or 324, accused will be very anxious to know what the witnesses are deposing. And why he is so unconcerned? He said, she said uh, in Canada, that means his head is not all right. So suddenly I understood something uh, is wrong. Then I asked one advocate, uh, who knows, because the colloquial language used in the Karavali, in the coastal line is Kalebishi means a man has some mental problems. Then I stopped. It was already 1.45. I asked the advocate, see, come by 3 o'clock with an application, probably section 329 of IPC, make an application. I will make a, uh, I will put, put few questions. So promptly he filed an application and uh, I evaluated uh, the mother by putting four or five questions and into one of the questions she said at times her son would be so angry if she were to delay giving him food for five minutes he would throw away the food plate on somebody so then i thought there must be some serious mental problem i recorded and uh, my reasons as to why he needed a thorough psychiatric evaluation and sent him to be evaluated uh, uh, by uh, a government medical, a big government medical um, general hospital at Mangalore. He was, uh, within 15 days, I got a report that he was suffering from serious hallucination and delusion. And he, the doctor, the psychiatrist had opined, had opined that the accused needed treatment in Nimhans at Bangalore, a, a premier um, institute treating persons suffering from serious mental illness throughout in, in the whole of India. Accordingly, I referred. And after three months, he was treated by one of the, the then uh, finest psychiatrist, Dr. C.R. Chandrasekhar. And he had referred the accused with a report that he was able to stand the trial. And ultimately, the trial went on. In fact, I helped the learned advocate to cross-examine the doctor who had made an evaluation and I put a question on behalf of the 
court itself under section 165 of the evidence act which enables a court to put any question to any witness at any point of time whether relevant or relevant and ask for uh, production of documents the doctor promptly told that it was a very chronic case probably it was uh, undiagnosed and undetected and untreated and therefore giving benefit available under section 84 of ipc i acquitted him section 84 state if a person has done any committed any offense without knowing the legal consequences of the same he would be entitled for benefit under the general exceptions particularly section 84 why i uh, i am uh, uh, highlighting this is that probably he was a young advocate he had no much exposure on conducting criminal cases but what would have been if I was not diligent enough to observe his unusual movements, unusual, uh, say, movements in the court? Therefore, lawyers conducting criminal cases must try to first evaluate, uh, evaluate their clients and find out whether anything, because the you know, it is ultimately the burden of the prosecution to prove the guilt of the accused beyond reasonable doubt. If for any reason the prosecution is able to prove the guilt of the accused beyond reasonable doubt, the accused must also try as to whether he could defend, he or she could defend his client uh, uh, for uh, benefit under the general exceptions. Under the general exceptions. I was a sessions judge at Mandya. It's also a district headquarters. A young advocate who was uh, mostly conducting criminal civil appeals he was a, he was a pure civil lawyer uh, and one day uh, he by about 12 30 or 1 o'clock he started uh, arguing a criminal case i jocularly told him mr basavaraj why how are you that you are arguing a criminal case you are always a civil lawyer you conduct only civil cases he told me that this is a case from my native place Therefore, they had sent, they were all poor people. Uh, all the accused had been convicted for offence punishable under section 326 of IPC, means causing grievous hurt uh, with a deadly weapon. So, the case was <clears throat> uh, uh, that uh, accused number 1 to 5 had trespassed into the well, land of PW1 uh, and had, uh, the accused number 1 had uh, a sickle in his hand and all of them trespassed into the land and uh, committed writing and accused, num accused number two held accused number one, uh, PW1 and accused number one assaulted as a result of the same uh, one of the fingers of the right hand uh, had been fractured. So then this was the gist of the case. Then I was just looking to the medical evidence as to whether I could convert this case into a case for offence punishable under section 324 of IPC so that I can impose, uh, say, uh, confirm the conviction uh, and uh, confirm the sentence of fine of rupees 5000 and let them. But uh, the uh, evidence, the, crim the medical evidence was quite clear about uh, the fracture and the uh, alignment of the bone being uh, disrupted. So there was no course. I was just going through P the when he was arguing, I was just going through the evidence of PW1. By the time it was uh, 2 o'clock, I told him, come by 3 o'clock and uh, think whether you have any defense under section, uh, sections 96 to 106 of IPC, general defense. But soon after uh, taking foot in my chamber, I just went through, so seriously went through the evidence of PW1. What was the case was, the mother of accused number one had availed some financial loan from PW1 and he was unable to pay the interest for them. As a result of the same, the mother of PW1 had handed over this land so that PW1 could use that land and get usufructus and use the same in lieu of or instead of the interest he was expected to, uh, uh, his mother was expected to give. In the entire evidence, there was, uh, it was in respect of an agricultural land, there was, there was no revenue record uh, stating that 
Uh, PW1 was in possession of the point of uh, land at any point of time. No RTC, that is revenue uh, tenancy certificate, uh, RTC record of rights had not been produced. And uh, there was absolutely no evidence to uh, even uh, peripherally show that the land in question belonging to the mother of accused number one had been handed over to PW1. Then I said, it's a very clear case of uh, granting relief under the private defense because being the son of the original owner, he was entitled to repel the interference of anybody. So PW1 was really an outsider. He, he the, the case ultimately uh, reflected that PW1 wanted to interfere with the possession of the land of the mother of P, accused number one and therefore accused number one was entitled to repel the same and any injury inflicted by him as a result of the same would cover under the private defense. I dictated in the open court and accused all the and acquitted all the uh, accused and of course I just went through some of the decisions which were found in the footnote of section 96 to 104 and that's how Therefore, because he was a, was a very, very good advocate on the civil side, but he had no exposure on the criminal side. So, well, whenever, whenever advocate takes up a criminal case, he must also see as to whether there is any chance of getting him some relief under the general exceptions in case the prosecution were to prove the case. With this background, friends, I would uh, uh, like to take as to how this is to be dealt with. Because general exceptions, court cannot presume general exceptions. Whoever takes up the defense under the general exceptions, that is found in section 76 to 106, the burden is up, always upon the accused. Because section 105 of the Evidence Act specifically mandates that whoever, whoever takes up the defense under the general exception, the burden is always upon the person taking up the same. In a criminal case where there are no special provisions with regard to, to the Mm, burden of proof, the burden is always, the general burden is always upon the prosecution to prove that the accused has committed the offence in question beyond all reasonable doubt. What is reasonable doubt? Nowhere it is explained in Evidence Act. Uh, sorry, nowhere it is found in the sections of Evidence Act. Then how do we, how have we, how have we have been applying this concept of proof beyond reasonable doubt. It's a question. If even if you section, even if you see section three of the Evidence Act, you do not see anything about this concept. See, we have all inherited the Anglo-Saxon law, the English law. They were our masters. So the courts in England have had been applying this principle of proof beyond reasonable doubt. And that is also brought into our criminal jurisprudence in India. And as a result of the same, uh, we have been applying. And in one of the leading judgments, I request all the advocates to keep this in mind and read this judgment. AIR 1988. AIR 1988 SC Supreme Court page. 2451, State of UP versus Krishna Gopal. This is an eloquent judgment authored by Justice M.N. Venkata Chalaya at that point of time of the Supreme Court, who ultimately became, finally became the Chief Justice, one of the celebrated Chief Justices. India, he has eloquently explained this concept. 
and this decision in krishna gopal has been referred to in in subsequent cases so there therefore the burden is always upon the prosecution to prove the guilt of the accused but so far as the general exceptions if an accused were to take uh, uh, the defense uh, protection if you were to take protection under the general defense burden is always upon him under section 105 but how to prove that burden whether the same burden as is cast upon the prosecution is to be followed no we it can be it can be proved by mere preponderance of probabilities friends probably at the cost of repetition i tell you what is preponderance of probability and what is proof of proof beyond reasonable doubt all civil cases the benchmark for evaluating the evidence is preponderance of probabilities what a normal man or a normal man would come to a conclusion under the set of circumstances but in a criminal case it is also preponderance of probabilities but on a higher degree of preponderance of probabilities which we call it as proof beyond reasonable doubt friends i uh, would like all of you to know about a very important judgment of the supreme court reported in 2010 second volume scc triple 3 2010 to second volume scc triple 3 darshan singh versus state of punjab it is authored by didan j justice dalveer bhandari who is presently the judge of international court of justice he has authored many judgments all of you know one of the judgments is uh, with regard to the scope of section 438 of uh, crpc siddaram pamhatres case uh, you know uh, is a leading judgment of the supreme court on section 438 uh, referring to various earlier decisions of the supreme court uh, justice uh, dalveer bandari in paragraph 58 of the judgment has summed up and highlighted the principles with regard to self defense <clears throat> before highlighting not mute agide Yes, sir. I think you should give the option to sir. It had been entirely mute. It was muted. So, Vikas. that would tell it what would at least give sir option to sir ivaga option kottidare vikas unmute maadbodu okay some video of it okay okay i am audible and uh, visible yes please sir okay okay so okay. in in one of the uh, normal normally 
normally the trend of the courts it's very difficult to accept the plea of private defense the, the courts because if the prosecution is able to prove and since the burden of proving such uh, uh, defense is upon the uh, is upon the um, accused this will not be usually accepted but in one of the judgments of the karnataka high court reported in 1991 scc online karnataka 570 1991 scc online karnataka 570 shivappa lakshman savadi shivappa lakshman savadi versus state of karnataka it is a division bench decision of the honorable high court of karnataka it's an eloquent judgment i request all of you to uh, study this judgment and you will now then understand what is the scope of the private defense in in a village of athani taluk in belagam district of karnataka the incident in question happened on 18th december 1988 at about 8:30 pm one boy of 18 years was uh, carrying some goods in a bullock car and on the way by the side of the road the he had stopped and the bullocks attached to the cart ate some uh, standing crop the owner of the land got wild he came running near the bullock cart and uh, scolded the driver of the bullock cart as to why he allowed his bullocks to eat the crop then the boy went along with his uh, cart and uh, he intimated his owners who were at a distance the boy and the two owners came running on their bicycles near the hut top the accused that the owner of the land and the accused could see all these three persons coming in cycle speedily so he went in inside the hut and took out an axe which had a wooden handle of about 2 to 3 feet the moment they came near him he assaulted them with their with his axe and he inflicted a severe injury on one of the three persons mr keshav he sustained severe bleeding injuries and another person was also injured suddenly after hearing the alarm two witnesses came there running and uh, the injured were immediately shifted uh, in a tractor uh, to athani which was about 8 or 10 kilometers the statement of another injured who had also sustained a grievous injury was recorded by the police and at their instance as the injury was uh, injuries were severe they were asked to take to a higher medical institution and accordingly a chief was arranged and they were taken uh, to meerut which was a which is a very big uh, city in uh, maharashtra providing medical reliefs by the time they came near the hospital keshav was dead other another person who was already injured he was also treated the charge sheet was filed and, and as you know there was there is there was one witness who was also injured he is an eye witness so the normal presumption is that the injured will not leave out the real assailant in order to rope in persons unconnected with the offense the trial court promptly convicted the accused 
to undergo imprisonment for life and the same was challenged before the honorable high court of karnataka and as such the matter came up before the division bench justice p k shamsundar is the author of that eloquent uh, judgment so i don't know whether uh, any defense of uh, private defense was taken on behalf of the accused in the trial court but the learned advocate appearing for the accused that is the appellants in the high court had taken up the plea of private defense and what was that private defense the accused is a member belonging to uh, a backward caste the persons who had come on their bicycles were members of a majority community they had lands surrounding the small holding of this accused and they were making efforts to dispose of him and take his that was her his land and that attempts had been were being made many a times by the pw1 and the deceased and their family members who belong to the majority community so this theory of self and as a result of the same the accused entertained an honest belief that they were coming to murder him so as long as the accused entertained a bona fide belief of danger to his life and liberty life and limbs he was entitled to act to defend himself and if in the event he has caused the death it would come under the self defense private defense as contemplated under section 104 of ipc ultimately the honorable high court of karnataka gave benefit to the accused under the private defense and acquitted so it's a wonderful eloquent judgment in that judgment you find many decisions as to the burden of proof on the accused who takes up the plea of defense and the question is whether the whether this defense ha- should have been taken in the trial court no even if no defense is taken up private defense is taken up either cross examining the witnesses for the accused uh, witnesses of the prosecution or if no such defense is taken up in his exam in the in his or her their examination under section 313 of crpc still from the materials available on record if the accused can take up the plea of private defense there is no legal inhibition therefore even if such a plea is not taken up in by the accused in the trial court such a plea of private defense can be taken up in the appeal the only caveat that the accused will have to prove the same and the burden of proof is consistent with section 105 of evidence act friends uh, i would uh, like to uh uh bring to your notice one one very very important judgment of the supreme court reported in 1976 volume 4 scc 394 lakshmi singh and others was the state of bihar i don't want to go in in detail to the facts of the case ultimately what is the law reiterated in this judgment authored by justice 
फजल अली इज दैट इफ इन ए क्रिमिनल केस the prosecution has failed to prove the injuries sustained by the accused it would be a important factor on behalf of the accused so the injuries would speak according to the honorable supreme court as to who was the aggressor probably pw1 might have been might have sustained a grievous injury say punishable under section 324 of ipc accused might have only sustained simple injuries as contemplated under section 324 of ipc if ultimately it is probabilized by the accused that the witness or witnesses examined on behalf of the prosecution were the aggressors then the benefit of doubt would be given under section under the private defense uh in paragraph uh, 18 of the set judgment decision it is held as follows quote thus in view of the inherent improbabilities the serious omissions and infirmities the interested or inimical nature of the evidence and other circumstances pointed out to by us we are clearly of the opinion that the prosecution has miserably failed to prove the case against the appellants beyond reasonable doubt normally this court that is the apex court does not interfere in an appeal by special leave with concurrent finding of fact but this is one of those cases where judgment of the high court is manifestly perverse and where the high court has not considered important circumstances which completely demolished the prosecution case in fact the high court has hardly made any real attempt to analyze or discuss the evidence and has merely affirmed the finding of the sessions jet by narrating the evidence relied upon by it we have already pointed out that on one of the most important points arising in a criminal case namely non explanation of the injuries of the person of the accused by the prosecution the high court has not only committed an error an error of fact but an error of law by showing a lack of proper appreciation of the principles decided by this court ultimately what we can say is if the if there is uh, uh, in uh, if the witnesses are inimically disposed towards the accused and they are uh, the the court will have to be very skeptical and cautious uh with regard to their version and such version will have to be taken with a pinch of salt particularly when the accused themselves have sustained injuries let us assume uh, uh, uh in your neighbor house by about let's say midnight there is an alarm somebody is crying you will see somebody has already trespassed there into their house and uh, they have been held captive and you take something you know you have a gun you you come back to your house and you have a uh, say pistol a licensed pistol and if to save those innocent persons who have already been kept taken captive and uh, being injured and if you shoot at them it would not because you are trying to save persons who have been inflicting uh say either either trying to commit their murder or causing serious injuries to their limbs so under such circumstances it would not be an offense because it would be a non offense because of this general exceptions lastly friends coming to the um darshan singh's case decided by the honorable high court bondable supreme court that is justice dalveer bandari 10 points have been clearly enunciated i will just quote paragraph 58 self preservation is the basic human instinct and is duly recognized by the criminal jurisprudence of all civilized countries all free democratic and civilized countries recognize the right of private defense within certain reasonable limits 
because it is the duty of every state to protect their citizens. But at the same time, if a citizen be, is being attacked by somebody without there being any reason, so then during such course, the, the, the such innocent person need to be protected. The right of private defense is available only to one who is suddenly confronted with the necessity of averting an impending danger and not self-creation. That means there must be a reasonable apprehension of danger to the life and liberty. And as long as that persists using the private defense and retaliation would be justified. And what, what the, the, the uh, caveat put is, is available only to one who is suddenly confronted with the necessity of averting an impending danger and not self-creation. Friends, these sections, 76 to 106, one, imp one another important section is section 99, which specifically states that acts against which there is no private defense. For example, if a police officer armed by a warrant issued by a court, criminal court, comes to one's house to arrest somebody, the two in a uniform, he cannot have any retaliation to the police officer. If the police officer uses extra force, then what was required? then only repulsion could be there. Therefore, the private, the general exceptions will have, is, has a caveat in section 99. Three, a mere reasonable apprehension is enough to put the right of self-defense into operation. In other words, it is not necessary that there should be an actual commission of the offense in order to give rise to the right of private defense. It is enough if the accused apprehended that such an offence is contemplated and it is likely to be committed if the right of private defence is not exercised. That is, this is what this principle was applied by the Honourable High Court of Karnataka in Lakshmana Shivappa Lakshmana Savadi's case because the, the, the apprehension entertained by the accused that there would be danger to his life and limb because he, the, the manner in which all these three persons came running on with speedily in their uh, motor bicycles to his house, he had already entertained an, an apprehension and that apprehension was valid. Fourth one, the right of private defense commences as soon as reasonable apprehension arises and it is coterminous with the duration of such apprehension. That means the moment that apprehension goes, no retaliation should take place. It is unrealistic to expect a person under assault to modulate his defense step by step with any arith arithmetical exactitude. In private defense, the force used by the accused ought not to be wholly disproportionate or much greater than necessary for protection of the person of the property. It is well settled that even if the accused does not plead defense, self-defense, it is open to consider such a plea if the same arises from the material on record. That means if for any reason during the evaluation of the evidence, the learned judge comes to the conclusion that the that right of private defense is made out, notwithstanding the fact that the counsel for the accused has pleaded, even then the court can give the relief under the general exceptions that particularly the private defense. Let us assume that the advocate for the accused has not pleaded at all. But during the course of writing judgment and after evaluating the evidence, the judge comes to the country. This is a fit case in which the private defense could be given. It could be given. It is um, it is well settled that even if the accused does not plead self-defense, it is open to consider such a plea if the same arises from the material on record. The accused need not prove the existence of the right of private defense beyond reasonable doubt. It is enough if he proves it on the basis of preponderance of probabilities. 
the penal code confers the right of private defense only when the unlawful or unwrongful act is an offense a person who is in imminent and reasonable danger of losing his life or limb may in exercise of self defense inflict any harm even extending death on his assailant either when the assault is attempted or directly threatened probably i still i i go back to my college days when my teacher who was dealing with criminal ipc had just asked whether the jailer who executes a convict on the warrant of the execution issued by the court which convicted him would be a murderer because he is also see he is executing so we were all because uh, we, we were uh, not quite prepared to say as to what to be done so this is a case though he is executing he is executing the orders of a court though ultimately it leads to the death of that person it would not be a murder that is also covered because it's a judicial act that's a judicial act friends uh, i don't want to go to the nuances of uh, uh, the general exceptions and particularly the private defense i have brought to your notice few instances uh, so that you will catch up with the uh, well laid principles please read general exceptions thoroughly and try to apply wherever it is possible let us assume that you fail in proving the private defense but ultimately the prosecution is expected to prove the guilt of the accused beyond all reasonable doubt and the prosecution just because you have taken up the plea of self defense the prosecution is not relieved of its initial responsibility of proving the case beyond reasonable doubt uh, this is what uh, i have felt that i should convey i am extremely grateful to mr vikas chatrat for giving giving me an opportunity i once again congratulate him for doing wonderful and human service uh, to the legal field through his uh, platform uh, he has not only uh, uh, roped in persons connected with law he has roped in uh, other persons uh, interdisciplinary Uh, to deal with interdisciplinary subjects of law uh, i once again uh, congratulate uh, mr trivikram for supporting him uh, thank you viewers if you have any one or two questions i can just uh, uh, try to answer before we go to the question and answer session uh, i would like to welcome mr karthik bhushan the deputy Sol solicitor general of india for karnataka sir i would request you to speak a few words But after that, we will take up the Q and A session. That devotion, sir. We are unmuting him. Shanti. We would also like to thank Nataraju, the advocate, who has shared all the judgments which sir was discussing during his erudite session. Mr. Shanti, Shanti Pushanti, I will just take as to whether there is any question. I will take it from the YouTube. Yeah. Meanwhile, we take up the Q and A session. Post that, I think we will give him an opportunity. This is by Yushu Mishra. Should private defence be exercised in proportion to the imminent danger? No, no. I, in fact, Justice uh, the Dalvir Bandari has just settled. There cannot be any mathematical mathematical precision. It all depends upon the reasonable apprehension that uh, the accused entertains. If he if he if he entertains a reasonable apprehension that he is he is he will be murdered, uh, though not ultimately uh, he may not be murdered or a very serious injury be inflicted upon him. Still, he can. Uh, exercise the private defense there cannot be any mathematical precision in this regard that's what uh, exactly said ah uh, it is unrealistic to expect a person under assault to modulate his defense step by step with any arithmetical exactitude 
In fact, I request all of you to read Darshan Singh's case of Justice Dalvis Bandare because he has referred to earlier decisions of the Supreme Court on various uh, aspects and has uh, ultimately called out the principles uh, found therein. So, Trikam, uh, there's no question on the YouTube also. But I have a question, sir. Yeah. Uh, made it very clear that if though the defense of uh, private defense is not taken during the course of trial, uh, it could be taken perhaps during the subsequent uh, appeal or the revision stage. Yes. Do we have any uh, judicial precedents for this? Sir? No. Uh, uh, I, I don't know whether uh, it was argued in this election. Uh, I have not come across uh, uh, anything. In fact, please, uh, please take. Uh, in, in my own case, it would be it was I who took up that uh, hell, uh, to, took up that defense and helped the learned uh, counsel appearing for the accused. As a result of which, we, he could get conviction. See, ultimately, see the role of a judge, the role of the court is to find out the truth. Is it not satya meva jayate? Lawyers, being the officers of the court, assist the court. The duty of the prosecution is not to get a conviction. Is it not? The, the duty of an advocate appearing for a, an accused to, to defend him somehow. But so far as the duty of a prosecution, prosecutor is concerned to place all the materials before the court and enable the court to take an appropriate conclusion. Therefore, the court has a, a greater responsibility. And therefore, uh, if even if it is not pleaded and if for any, for any reason the court were to come to a conclusion that this is a fit case in which the plea of self-defense could be given. And suppose, let us assume the prosecution goes in appeal or revision. Uh, the, 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 the appellate court or the trial court should not have given this defense on its own. It will not be accepted. The, 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 in fact, the duty of the court will be appreciated. Yeah. So the last question we are taking. One has asked for the citation of Darshan Singh. I will ask. Someone to share it and uh, could you just, uh, uh, Jawad says, could you just give the section 99 explanation? 99? Yes, sir. See, 99 is a caveat in the sense act second is which there is no private defense i just gave you an example a police officer has come to arrest somebody with a uh, you know, armed with a warrant issue warrant of arrest issued by a uh, court so if he, he comes to house and he wants to catch him and take away it cannot be found fault with though it appear, though it appears to him that he was uh, interfering with his uh, life and liberty in the in the in the meantime if for any reason the police were to exercise uh, uh, right beyond uh, contemplated then it can be referred yes sir the last question whether the plea of private defense need not be taken in trial court but should suggestions be mandatorily given to it uh, in the cross examination no, 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 no. If it, if it is if it is taken in the cross examination, it is well and good. Even if it is not taken from the materials on re record, if during the course of submission of argument, the learned counsel for the accused comes to a conclusion that a private defense is made out, he can present it, and that can be presented even in an appeal without having taken such a plea in the trial court. Appeal or revision, Mr. Vikram has already asked a question on this. Thank you, sir, for sharing knowledge. And thank you, thank you for the insightful sessions from your side. And thank you to Trikram for connecting with such wonderful persons who are good human beings as well as good resources. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank so you. Grateful to you, sir. Thank you so much.